Hello everyone and welcome to ATL Falcon UK. Uh, this week me and Carol are joined by Liam who's going to co-host a little bit and then we've got Miles and Tori who have both been on previously so I'm pretty sure you know who they are by now and they're clearly doing very well for themselves anyway so we're just a bit on the side. Um, <laughs> before we get started on the draft talk which is what we we're going to cover a little bit with them, um, the Falcons have been announced to be playing the Jets in London so Cal go on get us going. <laughs> If I swear, I apologise straight away, but I am absolutely <laughs> hyped for this. I've been waiting all day, I because obviously the, the schedule was meant to come out 8pm tonight, which is the rest of the games. And some, we had like a group chat and someone put it, it's, oh, it's out on literally the next five minutes. So it was, I was expecting it to be the Patriots, to be fair. So I'm glad it's the Jets, but I would have took anyone. I've already booked my hotel, so I'm going. I'm already there. <laughs> I, I booked the day off as well. I booked the day after off as well, so we can stay both right. nights yeah. already. So we are prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I it. will you will I think Tori will be coming over. I'm pretty sure you'll be persuading your boss to <laughs> bring you over. I absolutely am. I, I'm so excited and I do hope that I get to go. I'm hoping that we kind of change our COVID policies and it becomes more <laughs> Yeah. Probable that that I can go. I'm I'm fully banking on going. I mean, I this this will be my first like overseas trip, so I'm really excited. I really think I'm hoping that the bye week is going to be the week after, which I think it will be. Uh, so yeah. if that happens, I'm staying for like a whole ten days. Like I'm not going back <laughs> until they're playing again the next week. So uh, <laughs> London will be stuck with me for for a whole week, and I don't know what I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to see all the things. I'm going to do all the things. So. I'm personally, as uh, you know, just me personally, very excited. But I'm also really excited for just like the Falcons to get to to go over, and especially for you guys. I mean, this is yeah. really it, it's really the best of both worlds for for y'all. I mean, I'm sure y'all are way more excited than I am. So, so I'm <laughs> I'm pumped for y'all. Well, at least you get brand new sightseeing as well as well as the game. Like you said, you can go see literally all the attractions and anything that you want to do. Especially if you're staying for the whole period, you may as well make the most of it. So. To be fair, you're probably in a better position than we are. <laughs> I'm sure, uh, Liam. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be going down as well. Yeah, I'll be going. I um, I went obviously last time when we played the Lions. I think it was 2014. I think it was. Yeah, that was a traumatic experience. So um, <laughs> I'm hoping for hoping for something slightly more, slightly better this time. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. Like, it was so bad. Like, it was just, Obviously, my first ever Falcons game, yeah. and that yeah. happens, and you know, it almost put me off for life. But <laughs> <laughs> honestly, surprised you're still with them. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Are you going to try and get your way over here, Miles, or is that a little bit far fetched? I don't know how everyone works with. Uh... No, 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 no. I am. Uh, I will be trying to uh, to get over there. I have something in the works right now, so I'm hoping that um, that will be the case. So we're. I'm pretty excited. I mean, this this wasn't the game that I was hoping would be overseas, but uh, I because the, the, for some reason the the Falcons versus rookie quarterbacks seemed to just be like a kryptonite. You know, yeah, it just went off against the Falcons years ago. It was the Star Is Born headline with the Jets. So I'm just waiting for Zach Wilson to have his Star Is Born moment against the Falcons <laughs> national TV. <laughs> and, uh, hoping that's not the case, but uh, yeah, I am excited. I'm hoping to to get out there for that. See, I, I thought the little way a bit, just because the Jets weren't brilliant last year, I was like, oh, we're actually going to be competitive against them. Whereas some teams I was looking at, I was like, I am not spending all that money traveling all the way to the other side of the country, buying a hotel room and just yeah. see us get pulled. Yeah. So I'm all <laughs> I'm right with it. I'm expecting to beat the Jets. I mean, I don't, I, don't I, I, I sort of don't really care what roster they turn up with. I'm always expecting to beat the Jets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the way it is. Let's have a look. We've got people saying they've booked the flights and stuff. Oh, right, oh my god. <laughs> See, we want to go the other way as well, but I don't know if this season's probably a little bit too soon, maybe, just because of what you said as well, Tori. I don't know how like England will deal with us going over to America and things like that. So yeah, yeah. be a bit of a maybe yeah, interesting. Yeah. Risky booking the flights already, but you know. It is. <laughs> Be hard get, it's hard enough for us getting tickets over here. Like there's only the stadium only fits sixty thousand in and yeah. It's there's literally like every fan base, they don't care what game's going on, they want tickets. So there's probably like five hundred thousand people getting trying to get tickets yeah. for 
a game that's fitting 60,000 people in, so it's going to be a bit of a that's what, a I, lucky that's what I've noticed for some of the UK games, like especially with the Jaguars when they pan out to the stadium and they show the fans, they're wearing different jerseys for every yeah. team. From the Jaguars yeah. jersey, it's like Browns jersey, Steelers jerseys, Falcons jerseys, like they're all over the place. Yeah. I think that's the best part about it, really. I mean, obviously, I can't speak from experience because we've not been over there to see a game ourselves yet. But obviously, you split between two teams then. So, you know, you're with your own and then however many fans travel to watch the game. But when we went and I presume when Liam went as well, you literally see every single jersey. I mean, we only saw two other Falcons out of the <laughs> 70s. Where did we, we went Wembley, didn't we? So that's yeah. Wembley from 80 to 90,000. I can't remember. In fact, it's more than that, isn't it? But um, and we literally only saw two Falcons, but we did see team, like fans of every other team. So it is cool to like be part of it all. And I mean, it's probably different to a real NFL experience because we've just got random events on and people just throwing balls everywhere and stuff because there's nothing else <laughs> to do. But it's good. I think it be good. I think for the neutrals, you definitely like because we I went to two games a couple of years ago. You sort of pick a team. So obviously, when it's your own team, you obviously gonna spot them. But when it's and obviously a neutral game for yourself, like. Me and my dad went to one game and we was like, pick a team before. So you sort of root for that team, so you get like sort of excited. But to actually watch your own team, which is very rare, it must, I, I can't wait for it to be fair. <laughs> and it's Falcons, it's a Falcons home game, isn't it? Home game. Home so game. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people tend to uh, to side with the, uh, the home team because they get yeah. the, the whole fanfare and the intro videos that they do. So... Um, yeah, hopefully we'll have a lot of people on our side. But then again, Jets will probably be the underdog, so everyone loves an underdog. Yeah. That, <laughs> it'll be good for you all, too, with the home jerseys. They'll wear those god-awful gradient jerseys. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love them. They're, they're my favorite. Absolutely love them. I think we established why why a lot of the English people like the gradient jerseys so much, because they look a lot more like our our football kits as in our soccer kits yeah as in they, they have that feel about them whereas they don't have the typical nfl feel so i think that's why we all love them and you guys over there just aren't fans in general <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, <You're right>. but, <laughs> but um right okay we'll, we'll probably touch back on that at some point anyway but the real thing we got you both on for is the draft so do you both want to give us a little overview first and then we'll break down each player and, as well but Tori, do you wanna what do you what do you rank it overall? Um, I I kind of sit at like a B minus. Uh I if I were to give them a rank uh like a grade, um, yeah. that's the grade that I would give them because I I think that they did every I think I think I said this, but I think like Terry Fontano and Arthur Smith did exactly what they said they were gonna do, which is something that you never see happen with the GMs and coaches. They're usually, you know putting smoke screens up left and right but for the most part Terry Fontenot said he's a draft the best player available and he takes Kyle Pitts at number four and Arthur Smith said if in a perfect ideal situation you have depth on offensive and defensive line he picks yeah. two offensive linemen two defensive linemen so I think they did what they said they were going to do which I appreciated and then also making sure that they do grab some guys for need I thought Richie Grant was a really great pick in the second round um I really do think that he has the makeup and the ability to kind of be the face of this position group moving forward. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does kind of, you know, at, we're having rookie camp the, over the course of the next couple of days. And so I'll get to go out on Friday and, and check him yeah. out a little bit. We'll check them all out a little bit. So I'm excited about yeah. that. But um, I gave, I give a B minus just for the simple fact that they didn't grab a running back. And that was something that I was very, uh, perplexed by because leading into the draft, I was very much a proponent of, oh, the Falcons are going to draft a running back early. I was like second, yeah. third, fourth round, you'll see them draft a, a running back. And then we get into the fourth round and they haven't grabbed anybody yet. And I'm sitting there like, what is happening? Why isn't this happening? And, and then go through the whole entire draft and don't draft a running yeah. back and, and sign a couple guys um, on some undrafted, for, uh, a couple undrafted free agents at that position. But to me, I think it just goes to show that maybe they're putting more eggs in the basket for Mike Davis than maybe what I originally thought they were going to. Um, mm -hmm. So that was just from a personal standpoint. That's why I give them a B minus is because I was sitting here being like, oh, they're <laughs> going to take a running back. And then I was wrong. So yeah. uh, I, I think overall, I was very 
um, interested to see what their stra draft strategy was. And, and I thought that they did a good job of kind of making sure that they got, you know, a guy in Kyle Pitts that's going to be a, an impact player right away, but also making sure that they filled some needs because they definitely have many needs and they still have many needs yeah. across this roster. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd agree mostly with what you said there, Tori. Um, I, I'd give it probably a B plus. I, I personally liked it a good bit. Um, I think what held me back from giving them sort of an A, A minus type thing is I, as much as I love the Kyle Pitts pick, and I think that that was the right pick for the Falcons to make, I think what could have made that an A is in a perfect world having like that defensive end, that Chase Young type prospect sitting yeah. there. Obviously, you know, that there wasn't a prospect of that caliber there, but I think having a player – in theory if that was available there then that would have made it an a, a plus draft but regardless we're not there but i do like jalen mayfield the offensive line guys that we picked up in the later rounds um big fan personally of ade ogandeji because i covered him a good bit and uh, i think he's a great value pick for mm. for where they picked him and lord knows they need pass rush help and uh, i think he's a very underrated pick for, for where they got him because that notre dame defense had uh, you know, a lot of star-studded cast members on there, Jeremiah Wusakormo, and he was kind of a guy who was sort of forgotten about. But um, overall, I really liked what they did. Of course, you know, as we had talked about, Kyle Pitts was the one we loved. Richie Grant, a guy, I'm not, I, I don't really know a lot about him, to be honest with you. I mean, I've seen everything about him. I have a buddy in Orlando who's covered him and says he's very good, um, but I'm not going to pretend like I know all about him, really. Uh, he definitely fills a need with Keanu Neal gone and that secondary really struggling right now. Um, so hopefully, you know, he's a pleasant surprise. I just don't know a lot about him. As far as the running backs are concerned, I do like Mike Davis a lot. And I think that they can survive with what they've got at the, I mean, for the time being, I think I was a little disappointed that they didn't resign Ito Smith. Um, and cause I frankly really liked him a lot, but, uh, you know, I, obviously they have a plan there. Um, and maybe it's addressed next year. Again, we don't really know what this is, this team's going to look like for the time being. But uh, as far as the running backs concerned, I kind of liked it. Um, you know, I was hoping maybe a Travis Etienne or a, a Najee Harris would potentially fall there in the second round, but uh, they were picked a little bit earlier than I thought they would go. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd give it a B plus. I was I, I liked it. I thought it was a good draft. I'll say that. I'll say that. I'll say that. I'll say that. Uh, Liam, uh, Liam, Liam, yeah, I mean, I was I was certainly happy with it as a whole. Um, I think it was one of them, especially in the second round, where there was there probably were running backs that we could have taken then, but there were also other players that we needed that we did end up taking a safety. There were obviously corners there. There were potential, you know, pass rushers or linebackers there. So there was just so many options that it was kind of everybody would just maybe grades it on the like the preference. I mean, I was like Tori, I was expecting us to take a running back in the second or third. I was adamant we were going to. But, you know, it seems like they just, the right guy wasn't there at the right pick, which sometimes does happen. So they went with alternatives. Um, I said Mike Davis is, you know, somebody who looked really good last season. But other than the last season, he hasn't really done a whole lot in his career. You know, is he going to be able to replicate last season or is he going to struggle a little bit? We really don't really don't know. You know, I don't know if it means an increased role at running back for Patterson, maybe than he's used to doing. Obviously, he's a little bit of a gadget player, mainly a return man plays a bit of receiver, also plays a bit of running back. You know, I don't know if he's going to see uh, some increased carries than he's what he's used to. Then there's obviously Hawkins who we picked up as a undrafted free agent. Yeah, potentially could make you know make the cut and get onto the roster. I don't we don't really know yet. Obviously, we'll see what rookie camp and everything provides. But he looks like a, a decent prospect. Obviously, he wasn't um, good enough to get drafted essentially, but could be someone who ends up surprising us and getting onto the roster. Could still be a weak position for us, potentially, which is a little bit worrying. But I'm hoping to be surprised by the guys we've got. Something that I'll add, because we you were talking about um, Patterson kind of being a gadget guy. And that we talked to Desmond Kitchings, who is the new running backs coach. We talked to him. Gosh, it was either yesterday or the day before. All my days are running together. I don't know when we talked to who. <laughs> but I know we've talked to him in the last two days. And I asked him that. I was like, what role do you see CP kind of having in this offense? I was like, do you see him as a gadget guy? And he said that he didn't, which I was shocked. About. I was shocked because I was literally sitting there like, he's a gadget guy. He's going to be used in a lot of different ways. Like, there, there's no way that you can pigeonhole him into, like, one specific thing, one specific category. And then I asked 
Desmond that and he was like, no, I don't see him as a gadget guy. And, and he said, he made the comment, he was like, I think you have seen him in the last year or so kind of look like he could take on a more traditional running back role, which is very interesting. And he said it's something that he's seen even in his return game, which which I was just kind of like, okay, this is a, a very different idea than what I thought the Falcons yeah. were going to have with this specific player. Um, but maybe that's also why they didn't draft a running back. Like I think that's an argument that could be made is like they, they do think that CP, they can kind of transform him into – a more traditional looking back to kind of be that number two behind Mike Davis. And so that's just a little information that, that we found out like this week that I, I was very, very interested in. That's I think, I think with, I think with Ollison as well, I think the, the mm -hmm. must, the must trust him. I know he didn't, I did, he hardly played last year, but what he's seen from the year before, there must be a lot. To get rid of him, to keep him and get rid of Eto Smith, which was similar cap space, I think, there must be a lot of confidence in him. And we know what he did the season before. I think he, he was hard. He didn't, it was like six touchdowns, I think he ended up on. So in the red zone, he could be one who you're looking at who could be getting the touchdowns, etc. So I think there is a lot of trust in him even to be to try get into fight for the second running back mm. yeah he's an interesting one i don't say i don't know whether he's a three down back as such he seems to have his limitations, but hopefully he's going to um progress into something to do like him yeah sorry to interrupt you there liam but no, so so see he's he's a full-time running back that's what they said the idea was mm -hmm. he's going to be in the running backs room yeah he wow. he's listed as a running back he uh, Desmond Kitchens will be working with him as a running back. So, I mean, I definitely still think they're going to use him because you can't like overlook his catch radius. Like you can't overlook what he could provide yeah. as uh, I keep saying like, gadget player. Like <laughs> yeah. Like I keep saying gadget player because that's the only way that I could, I see him. So I'm yeah. so interested to see how they kind of incorporate him. And if maybe like, Des is like pulling our legs a little bit, trying to just like say, like, yeah, no, he is more of a traditional running back, or if they actually see him that way. But that's what he said this week. So, I, I mean, I, he's listed as a running back. So, we we shall see. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. yes. See, I think, I think this is why we get people on because we have more gossip than we ever have. So. <laughs> <laughs> Giving y'all all the gossip. Exactly. <laughs> just call me E Network. <laughs> Um, if we break it down a little bit then and, and not go too much in depth, but just run down each player, um, starting up at Kyle Pitts. So what is everyone's takes on that as a, not just as, as the pick, but him as a player? Mm -hmm. Anyone can start. Okay. Sure. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was just going to do a, like, a plug for a recent story that I wrote last week on, on right. Kyle Pitts. I talked to a bunch of different people and, uh, just about what they see in terms of how you have defenses try and guard him because he is such a mismatch. He is such a nightmare in terms of like, okay, do you put a corner on him? Do you put a linebacker on him? Like you just really don't know. And uh, Tim Brewster, I thought, who's the tight ends coach at Florida, he, I thought he had a really great couple of quotes where he was talking about the speed and the size of Kyle Pitts is what just separates him because he's so different. He's built so different. Like I think we use the term like built different all the time and it's kind of like overused, but yeah. with him, you actually can use that and it actually makes sense because he is. Uh, uh, Tim Brewster was like, he, he was like, have you ever like seen a thoroughbred horse like run? Have you ever been around one? And I was like, no. And he was like, that's the only way I know how to describe what it feels like when Kyle Pitts runs like by you. And he was like, you feel his speed. And I thought that was so, I thought that was such a great, like a great quote from him. And then also he was talking about how it's so hard for guys to play like press man with him because he was like, you know, in those 50, 50 ball situations, they're not 50-50 with him. They're they're 80-20. And, and that's that's crazy like odds. But when you look at kind of the, the Hit one, his catch radius, and then two, also just how how long he is, his wingspan. Like that's just yeah. really he's really different, a different type of guy. And I think it's really fun to think about him being in this offense, especially because Arthur Smith is such a tight ends guy. I mean, he even said like after they drafted Kyle Pitts, he was like, I mean, yeah, sure, you could say I'm pro. I guess I'm biased towards tight ends. I mean, that's how he got his start, and so. 
He loves using his tight ends. He loves using double tight ends. I think Hayden Hurst still has a role. And even though they didn't pick up his fifth-year option, I think he's still going to have a role in this offense, yeah. a pretty big one. Um, and yeah. I don't think it would be uh, like too far-fetched to think that they're going to throw out Kyle Pitts and Hayden Hurst in different packages. Like That's absolutely something I could see them doing. So very excited to see what they're going to cook up with, with Kyle Pitts because I think it's going to be fun. And I know we say that all the time about like – you know, getting excited about guys coming in and everybody like putting expectations on guys. But this is someone who is so different, like diff built different. The makeup of this guy is different that I think it is fun for a, a first time head coach, offensive play caller to get a hold of him. Yeah. Yeah, I remember feeling that way last year when we signed Todd Gurley with two first round <laughs> offenses. <laughs> oh, this is going to be so good. Little did we know? But yeah, no, as, as far as what you said, yeah, I mean, he's a unicorn. He's basically the Calvin Johnson of tight ends. And, you know, it's just with his physical gifts and Arthur Smith obviously knows what he's doing mm -hmm. with the tight ends. As you said, I guess my only main concern with Kyle Pitts, and there's not many, is just I don't know what we're dealing with as far as the blocking is concerned. I don't know how good a blocker he is, how much that's going to translate to the NFL. I mean, he's a tight end, so he knows he has to block. So it's not like something he's coming in and he's going to be just catching balls. But um, I mean, I'm sure Arthur Smith has a role designed for that, but, um, as far as concerns with it, that's the only thing I would have just because I, you know, when they show tape, they don't show blocking highlights. Of no. they, no. they show him going vertical. They show him making ridiculous catches. So, um, obviously, yeah. Having him with Hayden Hurst. I mean, everyone forgets about Hayden Hurst. Um, they all say Julio Ridley and, and Pitts. And I mean, Hey, I even throw Russell Gage in there because he's pretty good too, but yeah. Yeah, everyone's forgetting about Hayden Hurst. He really came on the second half of the season. And I think, like you said, he's, he, they didn't pick up his fifth-year option. So I think he's going to play a little pissed off a little bit. Yeah. I think he's going to be playing pretty good. So One thing I'll add about Hayden Hurst is that like, I think it's really interesting because I said last year when I came on the beat, I was like, all right, Hayden Hurst, you know, they acquired Hayden Hurst in the offseason. This is such a good like pick. I think this is a great pickup for like Matt Ryan and so on and so forth. But then you get into the the regular season and it's just kind of like, you know, he's getting a bone thrown like here and there, but that's kind of it. I really was going into last season being like he's – I even told people like put him on your fantasy league team because that's how much I thought that he was going to do some really good yeah. things. And and while he did, I, I felt like there was so much more untapped potential. I really, really did. And I still think that. And I think because Arthur Smith is the play caller now, you're going to see a wider range of what Hayden Hurst is going to be able to do. Because really, this is the first time that you could kind of throw him out there and put so many different roles for him and, and have different things schemed up for him. Because you think about it, he was with Baltimore. Baltimore, it, they're not going to throw him the ball. Like they're going, they're running the ball. Like they, they just are. And then yeah. you look at at last year with Dirk Cutter. I mean, Dirk was Dirk, and and that, and that, and I know everybody has their qualms and and everything about that. And you would think that when Julio goes down, that Hayden Hurst's role would increase. And while it did a little bit, not as much as you thought it would. But now you have someone coming in who's a play caller who specifically loves his tight end play. Specifically yeah. loves two set plays. I mean, the, the, this is – if you're Hayden Hurst, I know you're mad that you didn't get your fifth-year option picked up, but if you're going into the 2022 season knowing that the salary cap is going to go up and, and you can have a year under your belt where you went out and shined in, in an Arthur Smith uh, scheme that benefits tight ends, that's huge. I think, that, I think if you're Hayden Hurst, you're really excited about 2021. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you both on that. I think if anything, it's just going to trigger him more because he's got a point to prove. And in the back of his mind, whether everybody says it or not, he's got to know that not taking the options kind of still down to the cap space, regardless. Because you take a bigger hit this year as well, right? If you if if we kept with him, so I think we're kind of just having to manage ourselves a little bit better. So I don't think it's anything personal. I think he performed pretty well with the opportunities that he was given. It wasn't, like we said, it wasn't a great scheme last year, so not everybody had the opportunity to shine like they could right. have. Mm -hmm. But even under those circumstances, I was still really impressed with him, so I, I'm yeah. all for it. I'm all for both of them on the field at the same time. Um, we've just got a few comments, uh, kind of questiony comments, so I'm just going to pop them up and let you have a quick look because it's kind of <laughs> in relation to pits again. This, this is what I was going to mention. It's like the defense like eagles will be literally 
now they'll be week one. It's, it's another four months to go, but they'll be all over it. They'll be like, <laughs> who do we? Who do we double team? Really? Yeah. Even Gage, because everyone will be like, oh, they're not going to double. But then he's going to be like in space. It's going to be. I'll tell you, the best thing that happened for for Russell Gage was Julio Jones going out. I mean, I and I say that because we didn't really. I mean, Russell Gage wasn't super on my radar until we went into training camp, and he was, Mm -hmm. and he was very obviously the number three guy. Because even then, you're, I think it was like Laquan Treadwell they had picked up, and you're, you're thinking like maybe he was going to be number three, but no, it's like Russell Gage who's going out there and working with Julio and Calvin the whole entire time. And I'll tell you, Russell Gage is Matt. I will say this: Russell Gage is Matt Ryan's favorite third down. Uh, target like I truly believe that because you go back and I, I even looked at it and I was like how many third downs like did he actually like go to Russell Gage for and it was a lot it was it was a it was a lot of third and longs that he went to Russell Gage more than anybody else and that was yeah. very surprising no but to answer the question about the double team I have no idea like that's what these these defensive <laughs> coordinators are gonna have like they they get paid money to figure out how to cover a how fits in a Julio Jones I do not but we also yeah. have to think like Will Julio Jones be on this team in week one? That's that's another thing that you got to throw in there because you got that June 1st, uh, post-June 1st trade that you could potentially look at if the Falcons need more money, which they do need more money. So I'm curious to see what the Julio Jones story is going to shake out in terms of what happens this summer with him. Yeah. We were literally going to wait for that to come up. Like we knew that <laughs> we could not avoid that at any point. And you can't uh, avoid it. Yep. No, I can't speak for everyone, but even with the cap struggles at the moment, I'm so anti Julio leaving because that just cannot happen. Like, <laughs> not not just from a personal standpoint, but <laughs> as Arthur Smith coming into a new team and your own team, getting rid of the biggest or one of the biggest influences in that roster in your first year is a huge call. And then if, for example, there was struggles with getting your yards in there and everything like that, everybody would literally look straight at Arthur Smith and go, well, you got rid of your best or second best player. So it's on all on you. So I think you make yourself a target by doing that personally. Mm-hmm. Don't know what everyone else thinks though. Yeah, it's risky, certainly risky. I, um, it's a bit, as I'm saying, I wouldn't want to see him weave just because of who he is. That's how yeah. much impact he has on the team. Even when he's not playing, he still has a big impact on that team. Um, obviously, I, you know, I do appreciate the the monetary sort of issues that we do have, and he's taken up a large chunk of it. And especially when we know that he's not, you know, he's not been healthy for a little while now, and you don't want to pay a guy that much who's only going to play half the games. But yeah. at the same time, even if he is playing sort of half the games or a little bit more than half. He can have a massive impact. He can, you know, he can. He's one of them guys who can basically, if he's healthy and playing well, he can just take over a game and completely win it for you. Yeah. So, you know, I think the Lions are sort of on that Pitts is going to succeed and Ridley, for me, is Ryan on actually who you're being there as well. I think if you take one of those pieces away, we don't look as lethal anymore because you, you start. Obviously, we've been talking about. You know who did he double team and who did he put the best corner on and you could say it's Ridley because he could potentially be our number one guy now really in terms of receivers then you've got Pitts and obviously then you've got Julio but you take one of those away and the defensive coordinators are going to have a still not going to be easy but they're going to have a little bit easier time picking who to go with yeah because you're taking one of the big things and I think you know obviously Gage certainly can contribute and I do like Gage myself and I, I, he's a very trustworthy guy but he's not Julio um nobody is so I, 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 I'd, I'd, exp- I'd certainly be exploring every single option to save money before who we got before getting rid of who we are whatever yeah. options are out there I'd explore every single one of them and if it comes to it and we have to get rid of who we are then I'll care but I'll never forgive Terry ever <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a position that I envy right now because I mean, Liam as you said you pretty much hit it right on the head as far as what the situation is. The cap is as it is. And Julio just has not been, he's been walking glass the last season and a half. And, you know, it, as great as Julio is, I mean, you could say he's the best receiver of this entire generation in the last 10 years. That being said, he it doesn't play a lot anymore. There's, there's always something wrong with that toe of his or that foot. You know, there's always a nagging thing. He's always on the injury list. And I believe what he's 32 now. That's sort of that age where, 
these guys kind of fall off, especially the big guys, because their body takes a lot more shots than the littler guys. So, I mean, why Calvin yeah. Johnson retired so early? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it's very difficult because you can look like a genius or a dummy in both ways. You know, you're a genius if Julio comes back healthy, he, you know, fully stacked with Ridley, with Pitts, with Gage, all these guys. But the moment that he gets hit and the moment that he's out for the season and you don't trade him and his value is yeah. at the floor, you can only get a fifth round pick for the guy, then that's when you might look a little bad. Why aren't you, mm -hmm. why didn't you trade him in the off season? All the signs were there. He has yeah. his injury list. So it's a difficult position. I don't envy uh, Terry Fontenot for this. Mm -hmm. No. I, uh, go on, Cal. I, th I think, I think when he came out and said we're in win mode now, I think it's, I do see him leaving, but I, I think he will, he'll be here this year. Then next year, I think we will trade him whether he's fit all year or not. I think it will be then, but, I think just because it was the win mode now, I think it's just if you are in a win mode now, you at least do whatever you can to keep him for at least this year when you've got all your weapons. Um, yeah. It's your first year, and then if it doesn't work out, then you can trade him after that. Uh, obviously, we know we need like what mentioned on the, sc the screen. Grady Jow is probably one of the most likely to be uh, reconstructed if it happens. Uh, but I think I, I I can see him leaving in the future. But I think this year. If we if we are in win mode, like they say, you you keep him for at least this year. Yeah. Right. That that just hurt me having a conversation. So we'll move on. To that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, if if they extend Grady Jarrett or restructure him, you don't have to worry about it. Exactly, and that's yeah. what I'm hoping for. I hope to wake up one morning, open my phone, and that's the news <laughs> on my screen. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hold my breath just yet because I know what the I know what the league's like. So I think Tommy, you you speak to him more often. I think you can give him a bit of a nudge from us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, we'll move down the draft just a little bit. So uh, on to Richie Grant. Mine and Cal's knowledge of college football is pretty poor, but that's just because we're pretty new to it. So. Most of our research comes after we've acquired a player as opposed to beforehand, <laughs> like the majority of you. So if anyone's got any takes, we're more than happy to listen to them. I love Richie Grant. Like I, I said that already. I'm, I'm, yeah. I think that's a really good pick in, in their second round. And I know like guys could go out in their first year, second year, especially cornerbacks and safeties and any guy in the secondary, they're going to, you know, the fact that AJ Terrell did as well as he did in his rookie year is still shocking to me because you don't see guys in the secondary do that well in their very first year. So I do think Richie Grant's going to have a lot on his shoulders and he's going to take some, some bumps and some bruises and all that kind of stuff in his first year. But I think overall I'm very excited about it because he adds a certain versatility that I think is what's needed in Dean P's scheme. I mean, you think about the way that Dean P's yeah. schemes for secondary guys, schemes, schemes for his safeties, they're all over the field. And he ha he asked them to do a lot. And it's, he asked them fr the front seven to do a lot too. But he, I mean, it's just really interesting to see the versatility of this draft class and understanding that's the way that it, when they were making draft decisions, it almost was like, okay, we need to get the most versatile guys we can get in there because one, we're probably not going to have a huge roster because we don't have the funds to have a huge roster. And two, you're going to have to ask a lot of guys to do a lot of different things. And so when, when I'm thinking about Richie Grant as a second rounder, I thought he was the best safety in, in the group. I know people will, will argue the guy from TCU, uh, Trayvon, uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Mo Rig. Mo Rig. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mess it up every time. Uh, but, but with with him, I know a lot of people were like, he was the best safety in the bunch, and, and they didn't understand why the Falcons picked Rich Grant over him. But I liked Rich Grant more than I than I did uh, Trayvon, and I, maybe it was because like Dane Brugler, who who is our uh, draft like columnist guy, he he had Richie Grant in his uh, as the number one safety in his. Uh, they call it the beast, which is his draft guide, which is the, it, it was a lifesaver for me yeah. during draft season to look at that. I mean, he went through all the prospects and kind of gave so much information, more information than I even knew one person <laughs> could put together, but he did. It was pretty amazing work. Um, but he had Richie Grant as the number one safety in the group. And so I liked it. I liked it a lot. I know he comes from a technically smaller school, but uh, I, 
I mean, sometimes that doesn't matter to me. And uh, I think a lot of times that doesn't matter to me. And um, so I'm excited to see what he can do. And I think it'll be interesting to see kind of how he evolves as a player and how he develops as a player because here's you know here's a guy who's gonna get his snaps because he has to have those snaps yeah. you you have to play him um yeah. and i think it'll be good to have eric harris Ron Harmon in there with him to kind of show him the ropes a little bit at least in this first year so i like it um i don't know about everybody else but i, I was a big fan of that pick i actually said it was the best pick in the draft in my like draft recap which was a hot take for sure considering nice. how this is sitting right there but i liked it and maybe i'm gonna like Say in like two, three years, he's going to be terrible and not paying out at all and no longer be in the league. But that's, I mean, that's the risk you run covering football yeah. around this time. So I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> well, Tori, I'd say I trust your judgment as someone who doesn't know a whole lot about this guy. I mean, my, my only knowledge of him comes from a beat reporter who I know down in Orlando who covered him for a while. And I asked him about it. He said basically he got overshadowed by how bad their defense was as a whole. Central mm -hmm. Florida had a lot of defensive line issues, a lot of linebacker issues, and the secondary was sort of the bright spot led by him. So I guess sort of when you look at Central Florida's record, you see what they do. I mean, national champions a few years ago, but let's not forget about them. <laughs> Regardless, um, I, he basically said that he's been sort of the bright spot on this defense for some time. And Tori, as you said, you know, that sort of versatility that he brings to the table to me sort of seems like a little anti-Keanu Neal because Neal mm -hmm. seems like that one you know one punch hitter where he just yeah he's the hitter that's what he did he, he yeah. couldn't intercept balls he didn't really have uh those coverage skills that i think we all were expecting out of a first round pick um i think richie is a little bit more versatile in that regard to where he can he can get those interceptions he can he can come downfield and tackle mm -hmm. so um obviously i know i, I like keanu neal but he was lacking in those areas so i'm hoping that yeah. richie can sort of pick up for that and and as you said sort of add some uh, some pop to that dmp's defense yeah and, and yeah. one thing about Keanu Neal, he's now a linebacker. I mean, yeah. he goes out to yeah. he goes out to Dallas with with Dan Quinn, and he's like, "Hey, you're going to be a linebacker now." And I think that's crazy. I mean, he, he'll do well, I think, because he does pack a punch and he does have this the relatively like good size for for a smaller linebacker. So I like that. But you know, you're right that he was kind of one dimensional isn't the right way to say it. Yeah. That's not that's not the term of which I'm looking for, but it's the only word that's coming to mind. But he he did. He was like down in the box. He was a hitter. He I mean when they came across on like that's just who Keanu Neal was. And yeah. I think you don't have that with Richie Grant. You have like what you're saying, you have a guy who can kind of do a bunch of different things and play a bunch of different roles. Yeah. Yeah. No I don't. Uh Liam, I know you like your college football. Have you got anything on Grant or are you Neutral. Yeah, I mean, he's, just, he's a for me, he's a, he's a bit of a, a bit of a ball hawk. And that's what I like about him. He reads the game sort of really well. He's got plenty of interceptions and he's a uh, college time. And I think that's something he'll probably bring to us. It, he's a complete all rounder for me. He can do everything pretty well. Doesn't seem to have many weaknesses. Tackles pretty well. Uh, you know, so he's very different than Neil, but I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. Not saying Neil was a bad player, but I think the move to linebacker suits him that's that you know that suits his strengths more he's never a coverage guy he was always a hitter um well rich grant brings a bit more all-round game to us and we didn't we do need that secondary help i think obviously everyone was looking at corner but we know that we lost a lot of our safeties this time people you know view safety as a maybe a bit of a position that's not that important and but it really is and it's becoming more important all the time and if he can contribute to our you know, our turnovers, then that would be excellent for us this year. Yeah. No, I don't. Uh, if we want to move down the draft a little bit, do you want to go, Cal? Me? I literally, I'm, no. <laughs> my, uh, my knowledge is literally like Danny's, so it's a bit. The same as mine. Let's start with, obviously, round three was Jalen Mayfield, who was the only two games he played last year, but played a lot the year before. Um, yeah. Obviously, other people. I didn't expect to go all line in the third round. I think everyone was probably the same because I think everyone was still expecting that running back to come up. But it is a position what we could say we definitely need, like depth wise. So I think it is a good pickup from what people have said. Yeah, Jalen Mayfield was a very interesting pick for me. I mean, I, he wasn't really somebody who was on my radar because I considered him 
way more of a tackle than than a guard, which is what the Falcons need. I mean, that left guard position is wide open. So literally anyone has a chance to come in and take that spot. Um, But I I was very interested in Jalen Mayfield. I thought it was – yeah, I I was just – that was the biggest question mark I had in this draft was Jalen Mayfield in the third round. And it's because you don't have a lot of tape on him. And it's because they maybe are thinking that he could be the long-term answer at left guard, but you have Mm -hmm. to develop him there. And Mm -hmm. I think if they have a developmental plan, which they say they do for him to move to that spot, then, okay, like you have Josh Andrews that you can plug in at left guard for at least 2021. He signed a one-year deal. He's a a veteran guy. You just, you, you put him there for a year as you get Jalen Mayfield, his legs under him, and he can understand the role at left guard a little bit better and then put him in in 2022. I don't know if that's the plan. I assume that's the plan, Uh, but it's going to be a huge developmental process for, for Jalen Mayfield because he is, so young his reps are pretty limited especially if you're talking about him being an interior lineman um so overall I thought that there were other interior linemen on the board around that time that the Falcons could have taken um but that's nothing against Jalen Mayfield it's it's really just how I viewed him as as more of a tackle um so going to be interesting I'm curious to see kind of how he evolves you know we talk about the evolution of players in their first year and how the jump from like year one to year two is usually pretty significant I think that's exactly what you could see from someone like Jalen Mayfield where he very much could see a gigantic transition in his very first year in the league yeah Yeah. Um, I think that's the case too I mean again it's, it's hard to sort of dissect offensive lineman tape sometimes um me personally, with with all that taken into account, I do like the whole depth aspect of this. You know, having guys like Lindstrom and um, I always forget the other guy, McGarry, um, who you know sort of you know finally have a year under their belt. I know they dealt with their injuries last year, um, and you know all these guys are playing different positions. Alex Max gone now. Um, you have sort of a staple there in, J- in uh, Jake Matthews there, but I do like adding guys like Dalman and uh, Mayfield to sort of create that competition. And you know, there's Offensive line, we, we've seen guys go down before, and that can create mm-hmm. problems. You know, got like way back, like Harvey Dahl having his you know injury issues sometimes uh, back in the day. Um, you know, guys like Sam Baker not working out, sort of like that type of thing. And I mean, look at the Super Bowl. What happened yeah, in the Super exactly. Bowl? I mean, that's the most recent example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I I personally like adding the depth there as far as what they're going to bring and what positions they're going to play. I think that's something that. Tori, you'll probably figure out pretty quickly seeing that right there at training camp uh, during the battles there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, the only guy I've seen, uh, I've, I've seen two of these guys uh, play. There's Ade and I've seen Jalen Mayfield. Jalen Mayfield pushed around all the Notre Dame players. So on the one game that I saw him in person, he was pretty darn good. So uh, as far as that's concerned, I guess I like him. I don't know how that third round uh, draft grade goes. Um, but uh, I mean, again, from what I've seen, it looks good. I'll say that. I think <laughs> just touching on on what you both covered really is just that left guard spot that at the start of last season we were we were all saying we don't know who's going to start there. There's not a solid start. There's three or four people fighting. The fact that we're still in the same position concerns me a little bit, considering we have so many draft picks. <laughs> but if they groom someone into the position, then I'm fine with it. But not knowing who's starting on your line is a terrifying prospect every single time. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. It could be a very young line if he does end up starting even in week five or six. It's going to be a very, very yeah. young line apart from Matthews. Oh, yeah. but- I mean, if you think about it, it would be mm-hmm. Caleb McGarry, Chris Lindstrom, and your three. Matt Hennessy, if if Matt Hennessy's the, the guide center, which yeah. I know we'll talk about Drew Dahlman, which I love yeah. that pick. Um, but like so let's say Matt Hennessy and in second year at center, and then you have Jalen Mayfield at left guard, and then you have Jake Matthews at tackle, like that is that is a young, very young group. Yeah. And, and you you would you're worried about like protecting Matt Ryan. And granted, I do think that Chris Lindstrom is, is really good. I think that uh Caleb McGarry has made progress i really want to see him make a jump this year um it, but then those two uh, two more guys in the interior that you just don't know exactly how they're going to pan out in 2021 there's a lot of questions mm-hmm. for for this uh this offensive line that i'm curious to see how it shakes out yeah and with injuries that like 
although yes they sort of you know you could call them second year guys or third year guys or whatever but the with injuries are technically not because of how many times he played i mean hennessy technically obviously yes is his second year but realistically it's his first year because yeah. he barely played right so he you know there's just not that there's not that experience there and there's, there's Obviously, Matthews has got plenty of experience, and that's where all that's where the pretty much entirety of our experience will be. But you know, it's one of them, isn't it? Where you, you you can be young and still succeed, but you can also be like a rabbit in the headlights, and they could just mow us down. We just don't really know what we're going to get. But yeah, yeah, like Tori said, I think it's going to have to be Lindstrom and McGarry, like essentially stepping up um, yeah. into and taking more of an experienced leadership role on that line now with with Matthews and helping potentially Hennessy and potentially may feel that left guard and you know improving as a unit but having young guys that you know if we can keep this unit together and see the progress year on year that's a good thing for us because you know the offensive line at the end of the day the one working unit they all rely on each other yeah. so you know building it up from young a young team is, is is a good way of doing it but obviously that relies on us actually you know being successful and progressing each year if we keep chopping and changing it every year it never really works out but yeah I'm, I'm hopeful i think i think we've got a good offensive line on the whole but obviously there's still some question marks um but i'm hoping the actual scheme that we have deployed this year will improve the the way our offensive line yeah. um actually performs i think last last year we just you know matt was holding on to the ball for too long because I think a lot of our scheme, um, a lot of our routes were just taking too long to develop. Uh, obviously, it showed against the Saints when he was just on his backside all the time. Um, yeah. But I'm hoping you know, if we get the ball out a little bit quicker, running more play action with Smith, um, you know, the running game hopefully improves. We just, you know, we're using our tight ends a little bit more. I think that will give the offensive line a little bit of confidence, and we'll start to see the sack numbers go down. Hopefully. Yeah, Liam, you brought up an interesting point there because uh, the reason why I say it is it's something I noticed fairly recently. Um, there's this guy I follow once. I, his name's uh, beating me right now, but uh, he posts a lot of just film on you know wide receivers running routes and everything, and he did a feature on Calvin Ridley. And that's something I never really picked up until he showed that is those routes took forever to develop. Yeah. And Ridley was still making it work because he's a great route runner, but – he was just sort of analyzing what he was doing all of last year, and it's just taking forever to get going. I can't imagine how that was affecting some of the other receivers, add on to a, you know, not as good offensive line and Matt Ryan waiting for these guys to get open. Um, I think you said it. I think this offense could look a lot different just on route running alone. Yeah. I, I think, I know we said this last year as well, but there's so many offensive weapons in terms of the flair players this year that – you're hoping Matt Ryan doesn't have to hold the ball for quite as long, so there's not the opportunity to sack him. But I mean, that's like that's luxury talk because we've said that for years <laughs> and years, and it just never pans out quite like that in our heads. Yeah. Um, moving to the other side of the ball, we went with Darren Hall. So hopefully, AJ Terrell's new partner in crime. But uh, we get any takes on him, guys? Yeah, I liked him. I I thought that was a a, a nice pickup as well. Um, I thought that they would take a, a, another cornerback at some point, and I was pleased with the the spot that it fell in. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see. Maybe not just like for him specifically in his rookie year, but you know, AJ Terrell's not going anywhere. What you don't know is what their plans are for Isaiah Oliver, what their plans are for Kendall Sheffield. I know that when we talked to John Hoke, who's the new secondaries coach, he did make the comment that he likes Isaiah Oliver inside. You know, they did actually bring him in towards the end of the year, play a little bit of nickel. Um, So I I think that will be very interesting to see because I think if he does move inside, if they figure something out with Kendall Sheffield, then that maybe opens the door a little bit more than – than what it originally was. So I think he has a good shot to kind of come in and kind of make what he wants to of his rookie year. So so that's what I, I think of him. Yeah, I'm thinking um, that, well, obviously, I, I don't know what's actually going to happen, but I think Fabian Moreau could be playing mm-hmm. a starting role for us. He could be our quarterback too. I, I, I know he's had some injury problems and Washington gave up on him, but I think I think he's quite. I think he's got still got some potential, bro, and I think he could potentially shine for us. I'm hoping I'm right in that sense. He's 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 very fast. He's he's got you know when you look at his stat sheet when he's playing, he's it's pretty he's pretty solid. Um, so you know he might get thrusted into that sort of CB two role and alongside obviously Terrell and then I think 
um, with Oliver inside playing, you know, playing the same role as he played at the end of last year. I think that's got some potential. Yeah. As far, as far as Darren Hall is concerned, that's, this is another guy who I'm not going to pretend like I know a whole lot about other than looking at his <laughs> stats. Um, you know, I didn't really look a lot into him. But uh, as far as what the secondary is concerned, and, you know, we we've, I, we just talked about Richie Grant, A.J. Terrell, all that kind of stuff. I just want someone who can pick off the ball. They have no <laughs> had I mean, I really don't think they've had – I mean, D'Angelo Hall was, like, years and years ago, and even he wasn't elite at it. Um, Desmond Trufant wasn't a great ball. He was okay. But I feel like Atlanta has never had that sort of interception machine on the defense. And yeah. I'm still waiting to see it happen. I know Richie – or not Richie Grant. Um, Darren Hall uh, is is sort of increased his interception totals. You know, every year he was at uh, San Diego State. So I'm, I'm hoping to see that translate to, to the NFL. Again, I don't know a lot about him. Tori, you know a yeah. lot more about him than I do. Um, but uh, I'm just ho- – I mean, and again – who's to say that he he will or will not start this year there's still a lot to be said he's a late round draft pick so who knows if he can actually sneak his way into the starting lineup but again to have depth it's good they need it um but yeah i'm not gonna act like i know too much about him (laughs) yeah i think it was definitely a position of need like we needed um well moving on to the next um drew dalman i think this is a good pick i don't know much about him but as in i don't think many people expected us to take a center and I think this is really good for Hennessy and both because we sort of everyone's just like, oh, Hennessy's going to be the centre, but now it's like it's good competition. He he obviously needs it because he didn't yeah. play much last year, and I think these two, like what Liam said, it's like his it could be it's basically it's like his first year anyway because he hardly played last year. So I think I think Tory might know a bit more this week how how he does and out the next few weeks, but I think it's going to be a battle between them two and. I don't think it's it's Hennessy's spot. I think it's both of them to basically lose. Yeah. Yeah, I loved this pick. I thought the Drew Dahlman pick was one of the best picks. I, I really did. Um, just because exactly like what you're saying, you know, we all assumed when Matt Hennessy was taken last year or the year before last, whenever it was, no, it was last year. Uh, <laughs> like when he was taken last year, <laughs> you know, 2020, man. Uh, but when he was taken last year, you just knew he was the heir apparent to Alex Mack. And that's just what we've all been thinking. That's what everybody I think has just come to like understand. But if you don't have any contention, if you don't have any competition and you're just handed something, it, it does make you wonder like how much he had to work to get to that. So drafting yeah. Drew Dahlman is really important just to bring in somebody who can challenge him. And I do think Drew Dahlman will be able to challenge him. I think he comes from a system that will, I mean, he, he I think he's a very good leader, which I think is something that you need at that center position. And you need someone who, regardless of how young they are, they're going to be able to lead the offensive line because that's where communication comes from. Yeah. And, and, and so I think that's really important, especially when I'm thinking about the development of Matt Hennessy. I think sometimes Matt Hennessy is really quiet. And maybe that's just like from the interactions that I've had with him, but Maybe he turns it on when he's, you know, has the ball in his hands and he's getting ready to snap the ball. But that's something you absolutely need. And that's something that you absolutely had with Alex Mack. You, there was no doubt that Alex Mack was the leader, the, the vocal piece of this offensive line, and he's no longer there. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how those two push each other. And I do think that it's kind of a wide open a uh, spot at center as well between those two guys because I, I don't think that it's Matt Hennessy's just to like take over now that they've drafted Drew Dahlman. I think that yeah. there's an opportunity there for Drew Dahlman to come in and maybe turn a few heads in rookie camp and turn a few heads in training camp and kind of get some snaps under his belt a little bit and kind of be like, all right, no, I came because I wanted to play and I'm here because I want a starting spot. Mm-hmm. So be very interesting to see him very I'm looking forward to to dissecting that position specifically a lot more this summer yeah yeah it's all right like I mean you said it with with Hennessy when he was drafted the immediate he was immediately marketed as the heir apparent mm-hmm. yeah and that's what we were all expecting I mean the last name like Hennessy I was hoping that that would be the case too but again like you said <laughs> again, I like I like Drew Dahlman I really like the the um the depth that it brings the only concern that I have for you know bringing in guys like like Mayfield and um, and Dalman for you know having this sort of open competition there is the the worry that you know we're midway through the season maybe one guy isn't working out and they're flip flopping these guys yeah. and 
chemistry gets a little yeah. screwed up. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I absolutely think if you're gonna like who who you make the decision on, you should ride or die with them. Like you you yes. because I I'm not about switching things up unless it's injury. Like I'm not about switching things up on the offensive line. So I'm definitely with you there. Yeah, especially at the center position because mm -hmm. that's all about timing, and we've seen yeah. how that can result in yeah. And messed up snaps, fumbles, all that kind of stuff, especially with rookies, young guys like that, second year yep. guys. That's my biggest concern with it. Um, is just, you know, this competition goes past training camp, you know, we're in the preseason and it's one of those situations where it's like a um, you know, just one of those what's the the HBO series? Hard knocks, one of those hard knocks type. Right. <laughs> where, you know, it's this battle that still isn't sorted out yet, and we're waiting for the regular season to start, and we still don't know who the center is. Yeah. So yeah, um, that's one of those things, you know, I hope that they just make a decision and stick with it, like you said, and, you know, they just roll with it and whoever gets injured, then, you know, then you'd replace it. But uh, right. I hope that a decision is just set with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think to make it work. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, just as a side note, if you keep seeing me and Cal panic and go like that, it's because there's a massive storm and we're pretty close <laughs> to the oh, no. lightning, we're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the only problem yeah, is yeah, our yeah. storms are a lot smaller than America's. Ours is oh, like yeah, smaller. Like <laughs> Everything's bigger <laughs> over here. <laughs> <laughs> We're scared of small stuff, that's why. <laughs> but no, going back to obviously that, I think it is important to keep a fat like five same people all the time. I know you can change in camp, and I think this this with next couple of weeks with the lucky camp, I think that's going to be very important as well uh, but throughout the whole off season it is it is good you look at the top o lines in the nfl and you have five players who don't change even if there's a rookie coming in they, they make that their position uh, but a point what tori said about the obviously the alex mack was obviously outgoing a leadership and i think that's what we might miss i don't think lindstrom not the moment what i've seen of him is He's, he's a great guy, but I don't think he's, I don't know if he's got the leadership part of him on that Gary has, but obviously missing Alex Mack is going to be massive anyway. But we need, the centre is the most important position. Is he, like he said, they talk to each other, he's the main guy. So I think someone who's going to be outgoing, spoken, is a major part of the position as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this, I think this is somewhere where, people like Tory and, and Will McFadden that we've had on in the past actually have a, a little heads up over us because when Will was on the other week, I said the same sort of line that I, I don't see the vocals from um, Lindstrom and McGarry because as fans, when you're watching on the field, you don't always see what's actually going on. And he shot me right down and rightly so saying that Lindstrom and McGarry are actually pretty vocal guys, but it's just a shame that we don't really get that feeling when we're watching on the field. So I think even if they are in the backfield and everything like that, I'd like to see them like take that step up on the field and, and make it clear that they think they are the men for the job because everybody's replaceable at the end of the day. And I wouldn't want that to be the case. Like Liam said, we need some consistency there. So it'd be nice to, for them to be the stability around all these other younger guys that are coming in, even though they're young themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to skip past any draft picks, really, but I'm also also conscious of how long we've got, so I don't want to overrun too much. So instead of going through each other pick, if any of you just want to cover any of the other players that you you like look of or anything like that, then go ahead and we'll just dip into each one. Miles, you should talk about your guy. Yeah. yeah, I was I was gonna sort of double dip there with uh, with Graham and uh, and Ade because I think they're very mm -hmm. similar players. Uh, both of them sort of dabbled with defensive tackle and defensive end a little bit, so mm -hmm. they're very interchangeable. They both have experience getting after the quarterback, and they both sort of have that interior line experience. That you know, I mean, again, the Falcons have so many needs on the defensive line outside of Grady Jarrett. I mean, Grady Jarrett's the only good thing they have going on that line. I mean, you could argue Grady Jarrett's the only thing they got going on the entire defense. So, I mean, there's, they, they need a lot of in the trenches. Yeah. Um, but as far as Ade is concerned, a guy who I've covered, um, again, a guy who's been sort of overlooked during his time at Notre Dame because the defense has always been so consistently good. Um, yeah. All the talent that they had. I mean, Jeremiah Wusakoromoa sort of stole the spotlight. Kyle Hamilton as well in the secondary. But Ade sort of created a lot of those plays for the linebackers to make at Notre Dame because Notre Dame's very good at the linebacker level. They had two other guys who were drafted. So he was very good at sort of creating those plays to sort of stuff the line. His, his best feature wasn't getting after the quarterback. It was in the run game. That was where he made his presence felt at Notre Dame. And 
It was also felt in the passing game by sort of creating those mismatches so the linebackers could go and pressure the quarterback. So yeah. he didn't put up the you know the most eye popping numbers. You know his sacks weren't great, but still not bad. He has the ability to do so. So I really like getting him where he we got him. I think that was a good spot for him to to go. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's my quick analysis of that. I I, I do like Ade a lot. I think throwing him into the mix with people like Marlon Davidson that we did yeah. not get to see last year at all because he was the one that last year I was like, right, this is the man. He's fixing that D right up and everything, and we just didn't get a touch of him. So having him thrown into the mix with all of them, it's good competition again because even though Marlon's year two, he's also not year two because how many snaps did he get? You could probably count them on your fingers. So. There's a lot of players there going to be competing for the same sort of roles, which is exactly what we need to bring the best out of everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, go on. Is there anyone else? Any of you have uh, got your eyes on as such? I mean, we've talked about everybody, but Avery Williams and, and Frank Darby. So, I mean, yeah. I, I very, very much enjoyed Frank Darby's uh, <laughs> overall level of excitement to yeah. joining the Falcons. Yeah, I really thought good. he was so he was, was so awesome. great. Uh, we're talking to him sometime in the next three days. And I was actually – so the third day of the draft, I was actually in a wedding. I was in my best friend's wedding. So I was, like, walking down the aisle <laughs> as, you know, they're, everybody's <laughs> getting to talk to these draft picks. And, and so I'm – very excited to talk to him specifically because he just yeah. seems like he has such a big personality. Uh, I mean, we could talk about football all day long. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I love it when guys are super easy to talk to for like yeah. my job purposes. Like if I'm having to pull teeth to talk to somebody, I would rather not do that. Like I, I would rather not have to pull teeth to, to get somebody to talk to me. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be the case with him. So I'm, I'm pretty no, excited I about when, so. when we get to talk to him, especially him being like, a receiver like and he's coming into a situation where he knows like who he has before him like who he has ahead of him and yeah. i mean t- to still be so excited to get to come and like play for the falcons like the way he is i think it's so it's so fun it, it really just like puts a nice spin on things because i think sometimes people can take the draft way too seriously yeah. And I think he was a really nice reminder, like, hey, this is just a big deal just to, like, get drafted, and I'm just excited to go and play. It was a nice, refreshing, like, change of pace. I I enjoyed it. Yeah. I I think people need to remember these guys have worked their entire lives to get to this point, so it's absolutely irrelevant where you get drafted. You go in into the NFL, whether you play one snap or a thousand snaps, you're literally in the NFL. This is exactly what you've gone to achieve, and who's better to work under than Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, that's in a, been in a similar situation, obviously got drafted higher, but as in he's pretty new himself, only three years deep. And then you've got Gage and everything. You've got a nice mix of players there to be, to be playing alongside. So he's got a very good chance, but um, I think you might need a few drinks before you interview him though. So you're on his level because I feel like that's <laughs> that a good thought. It really is. I probably should have a few drinks before every interview. I'd make them. <laughs> Make it so much better. I love it. Um, we have got one question, which we were probably going to cover before we wrap up anyway. So favorite undrafted free agent. And there is, well, there was six just after the, the night. And then there's 20 now, I think, unless there's been a couple more in the mix. So is there anyone standing out to any of you? Open to pretty much everyone. JV um, and Hawkins. <laughs> That is it. Yeah. I, I know everybody was talking about like maybe Felipe Franks just because you get a quarterback in there. Was that who you were going to say? Yeah. Okay. I'll let you have him because I'll take Javian. Uh, I think that was, I mean, I thought that they were going to pick up a running back as an undrafted free agent. And I know they picked up another guy. Um, but I like Javian a whole lot. I mean, I covered Georgia Tech for a couple of years. And so he's a, he's a Louisville guy. So I've, seen him like adjacently um and so I really like him I think he kind of um kind of feels that like Edo Smith role to a certain degree I mean he's a he's a very quick guy he's he's not necessarily the guy who's gonna just like run through people but if he has the holes he has the potential to like really get some good yards and so um I, I think that I think he has a really good shot at making this roster. I know re, last week I t- kind of broke down like ten different guys who I thought had an opportunity to make to potentially make the roster of the twenty that that they've got right now, and he was one of them. And I, I truly believe that he could make a good mark on on this position group, knowing kind of how 
open it is and how yeah. you, you don't know what the future of this position group is going to be. So uh, that would be my pick. <laughs> but now you talk about Felipe, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're good. I, I liked Hawkins a lot too, because Lord, I mean, we, we, talk, we said it earlier, they needed a running back and I think he fills that role pretty well. Um, Felipe Franks, it's the easy choice. I'm going to go with it because I mean, they needed a quarterback. I mean, as much as I love AJ McCarron, he's pretty much a lesser version of Matt Ryan. They have a very similar game. Yeah. Uh, Felipe Franks is sort of that developmental prospect that you that I think is very good as an undrafted free agent. I wouldn't have drafted him. Um, I mean, some teams did. I mean, a lot of teams overdrafted. I mean, I think the Saints overdrafted Ian Book. But as far as Felipe Franks is concerned, his good is pretty good. His bad is awful. So that's who can sit down like and Falcons. <laughs> that does sound like a Falcons. He will yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's the perfect fit. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it, he definitely changes things up a little bit because he has that athleticism that we haven't seen in a long time because Matt just doesn't have that. Uh, yeah. but, what are you uh, talking about? Wheels. That was wheels on him. He, he can run for those first no, downs. I really wish long. Matt would run more because he's a lot more athletic than I think he thinks he is. But <laughs> besides the point, yeah, Felipe, you know, he's got the big arm. He's, he, can, he's, he can move a little bit in the pocket, uh, move outside of the pocket, and he can run a little bit. But, yeah, he's just got to tone down on the mistakes. But as far as undrafted free agent, I like where that is. I think it's a good – we haven't really had a developmental guy to sort of sit back there in a while. I mean, Kurt Benker was good, but he didn't have the sort of upside that uh, Felipe has. Um, so, I mean, it was something that was needed because there was just – before the draft, there was just Matt Ryan on the roster. So we yeah. Somebody there. yeah. Uh, have you got anyone, Liam, that's standing out to you, or is it going to be one of these two because uh, they are the common ones? <laughs> no, I'd say they, obviously they are probably the main two that I think have got the best shot of making something. But um, I did like uh, Antonio Nunn that we took from uh, Buffalo. Uh, I do, obviously, receive. I don't think he's got a lot of a chance to make, not much chance to probably make the roster just because, I mean, when we say, obviously, with Frank Darby, who, who he's got ahead of him, Obviously, none's got Frank Darby and the rest ahead of him. Oh, no. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the likelihood of him actually making the team is probably quite low, but I actually think he's quite a good player. He's so an edge. The reason why I like him is because I, in my mock draft, I did draft him in the seventh round. So, it was just good to get, uh, apart from Pitts, it was the only one I hit on that we actually <laughs> yeah, signing on the team. I didn't so, hit um, on a single one, so <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> got a little soft spot for him since he, uh, since he was somebody I actually picked. And he's, he's a pretty good player. He's got, um, he's, he's, not, he's not a bad option. I think he, he, you know, I think he's somebody who could make a roster, but just potentially not ours just because of how many, you know, you know, how many receivers we've got. I mean, potentially could. Get involved in the special teams, but um, yeah, he's a guy I like. I mean, it, it was a very run heavy offense in Buffalo, um, yeah, but I'd love to see him succeed just because, um, yeah, I, 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 I liked him. I watched him quite a bit in college and I thought he was a pretty good option for the for Buffalo, so um, yeah, he's, he's somebody I like, you know, probably not in our roster, but hopefully he'll stick around in the NFL. Can't forget about Dwayne Johnson, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many people are rooting for him just for the name it's brilliant <laughs> <I> love, it. <laughs> love it um but guys we don't want to take up too much of your time so um i think we'll call it a night because we've got we've had loads of breaking news loads of bits of everything so it's been awesome um thank you both well thank you all for coming on Liam. You, you're included but you're a co-host now so it doesn't really count the same um, but no, thank you both for coming on you know you're welcome back anytime and if we do hear any more news about the UK stuff, we will be getting you back on very soon so we can talk about that because we expect to see you both when you come over here. So no pressure at all. <laughs> we should do a live <laughs> podcast when we come over. That would yeah, be that so would be fun. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. We'll that do it great. from a pub as well. We'll literally all say that. <laughs> <laughs> ring, boom, stream, there we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sure we'll get some more news about that as time goes on. Um, have any of you got anything you'd like to plug before we wrap it up? Because Tori, I know you're writing tons of articles and stuff at the minute. So yeah, no, everybody can follow me at Tori underscore McElhaney, spelled exactly how it's spelled right there. Um, <laughs> definitely follow me on Twitter um, because you know the schedule is being released tonight, and I've got a uh, analysis that'll be running probably right after the schedule's released. So be on the lookout for that. Also working on kind of 
some big picture stories, some fun stories that I finally have time to really like look into with this coaching staff specifically. Um, and more stories kind of like what I just wrote about Kyle Pitts kind of talking to different guys about these draft guys, draft picks. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I know things are going to slow down with the summer. Hopefully I need it to slow down because I came on the beat <laughs> two weeks before training camp. And then, you know, Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov were fired five weeks in, and then we went into a coaching and GM search and then we went into free agency and then into the draft. So I'm going crazy. Um, so I need some vacation time. So hopefully we'll get that soon, but everybody follow on the athletic. You can follow me on Twitter too. So, but thank you guys for having me on. I'm probably going to, bounce really quick um to, to get on some interviews later so uh thank you guys for having me on y'all have a no good rest of your night no it's no problem. Problem. thank you speak to you soon uh miles would you like to plug anything as well i mean probably not quite as emphatically as tori did because nobody's as extravagant on this show but yeah we'd like to do anything <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, follow me on Twitter at Miles Garrett TV. Um, I will be tweeting a lot more uh, about the Falcons in the coming months. Um, I've got some stuff that works right now. So uh, stay tuned for that. I will be talking a lot more about it. So, yeah. Awesome. Sounds good to me. Um, right. On that note, we will wrap it up. We've covered a hell of a lot more things than I thought we were going to cover, to be fair. So it's been good to have the breaking news as we've been going along and stuff. But thank you all for watching. Uh, and we'll probably be back similar day next week with whatever else we can pick up along the way because I'd imagine it'd be a little bit quiet until there's any uh, any restructures and stuff now. So see you all soon, and thank you for coming on, guys. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Right.